Well, good morning, everybody. <laughs> Everything has to be just right, you know, to get this show started. Uh, we're glad you're here and uh, worshiping with us today at Unity Christian. This is as close to normal as we're going to get probably for a while. So we're glad you're here uh, with our new normal. Um, and, and, you know, we tried to make the seating as relaxed and as available as we possibly could. And it uh, looks like you've taken full advantage of that. And that's perfect. Great. We appreciate that. Just, uh, you know, I know some of you were a little lost when you walked in and didn't see your name on your seat. <laughs> What a word do I said? Just sit anywhere, and I, and I notice, you know, <laughs> prime, pr- you know, prime seats are still available. <laughs> I, I'll stand back a little so I won't spit on you. Okay. <laughs> hey, we are glad you're here. And back to our two services. Our kids are getting checked in, and uh, so uh, and, and it's all is going well and according to plan. Um, so. Uh, uh, we're glad you're here. Uh, we start a new series today uh, called uh, Worldview, and uh, we'll be uh, getting to that a little later on. It's uh, uh, several weeks. Uh, it's kind of a work in progress. So I'm not sure if it's how many weeks it's actually going to be. Depends on how worked up I get. <laughs> but we'll get to that a little later on. Why don't you stand right now, and the team's going to come and lead us in a time of singing together. Breaks the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder, who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is a failing love that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. You lay down. I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is a failing love that you would take my place. I sing for all that you've done for me. In the 
the darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came run there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt I first believed 
my chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending. I don't know uh, how many of you uh, are on Facebook, um, but I'm sure you'll remember a few years ago, maybe it wasn't like, uh, that long ago, because, <laughs> you know, Facebook is just, you know, you know it, it has no time. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But remember this, uh, let me show you this uh, slide here. Uh, remember the gold white dress deal, those of you? Because uh, re- both pictures are up there, but on Facebook a few a while back, whenever it was, this was a major controversy because they put up the picture and I saw a gold and white dress. And then I could not understand how anybody saw a black and blue dress. Now, these are, these are set up because this is the same. This is, but on Facebook, you only saw one dress. And some people saw the gold and white, while other people viewing the same picture saw black and blue. Huh? You with me on this? You understand? Yeah? Yeah, okay. Go on. Okay, thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Now there's a new thing. It hadn't gained as much traction, but there is this new thing where it's a pair of flip-flops. Have you seen that on? You know, it's a pair of, or tennis shoes, you know, that they're saying, hey, what color do you see? Let me tell you something. These things are really frustrating to me because with my level of color blindness, <laughs> I'm lucky to see anything, you know. Uh, but as it turns out, with the dress, go back to the dress for me there, uh, Jessica. Uh, uh, with the dress, uh, that, you know, you, you just, you, it, it, you either saw the gold and white or you saw the blue and the black. It was really weird. So much so, and it was such a phenomenon that occurred all over the world that no less than six universities did a major study on why people saw black and blue or why other people saw gold and white. And what they discovered was, through all the interviews and through how people viewed these, saw the the white and gold dress or black and blue dress, 
had all, everything to do with the lens on which they, of their life experience. Um, in other words, there's a long drawn out detail uh, and a lot of it had to do with how you, how you spent most of your time. If you spent most of your time in the daytime, you saw gold and white. No, if, you saw, if you saw black and blue, then probably you were more adapted to evening. And that's the, that's the lens that you viewed the dress through. You're based on your life experience. And that's why people saw different colors. You know, study after study after study showed that. Now, I just think that was fascinating, you know, that, you know, that how... The, how it, how your perception changed based on the, the exposure of your life experience, and you saw two totally different colors. Now that's just kind of weird to me, you know. But and yet, here's the thing: we're seeing exactly the same kind of phenomenon occurring in our country today. People viewing the world around them through their own experiential lens, and it is, uh, it is affecting their perspective on the world and whatever that experience is or whatever it has been and however it has influ influenced a, a person that has become the foundation of their truth that they see the world through that forms their perspective of the world in which they live and the world around them sociologists scholars and apologists call that a world view how you see the world. So what is that? Well, dictionary.com describes it this way, the overall perspective from which one sees and interprets the world. A collection of beliefs about life and the universe held by an individual. So how you see the world and how you interpret the world, that is your worldview. And the reality is, whether you realize it or not, you are impacted and influenced by the worldview of other people in your life. Things they say, things they do, things they teach, they, all about it impacts and influences your own personal worldview because your worldview is shaped by your education, by your family experiences, by those who influence you in your life and how you are influenced, influencers and the influence around you. And this, all of this comes together to, uh, uh, to help you or at least uh, gives you the perspective on how you're going to interpret the world around you. And this collection of beliefs about life affects every decision you make. Actually, it affects everything in your life. When you take the culmination of all the experiences and influences in your life, it will affect how you see God. How you view life. How you view death. How you view people. All based on your world view, how you view the past, how you view the present, and how you view the future. God wired each one of us in such a way that every time we start to make a decision, you know, maybe it's just from here to walk across the room, you know, but what if we don't even, it's, a, it's you know, we don't even think about it anymore, but when we, are, when we are about to make a decision, we start to make a decision, your mind, my mind, <laughs> mine may not be as instant as yours, <laughs> But our minds instantly access all of the information and all of the data in our mind in order for us to make a decision. And we make that decision unconsciously based on everything we know in here and on the basis of everything we believe to be true and what we believe to be real. You know, I'm going to say I'm going to walk to that door back there. And I know through all of that, that simple little choice to walk to the back door, I know, my mind's already told me, I'm going to have to navigate steps, I'm going to have to navigate this aisle, I may have to stay six feet from all of you. <laughs> my mind figures all that out unconsciously. I know that's what I'm going to do. And that's the way, that's a, uh, that, that's, that's a simple illustration about how that works, but it's, in reality, it's how we make thousands of those choices every day. And a lot of that has to do, those choices that we make and the decisions we make all have to do with our worldview, how we interpret the world around us. And here's the thing, if you have a faulty or false worldview, one that does not align with truth, you're going to see everything in your world as distorted, at least from your perspective, because you say, hey, this doesn't match up. This doesn't seem right. This doesn't seem true. And you're not able to make clear decisions. Well, that's why I'm into this series. That's why I started this series. And I told you last week, I believe 
in this day and age and with the current circumstances in our world today, this could very well be one of the most important, if not the most important sermon series I've done since my time in Unity and maybe even ever. Because I'm going to tell you, you know this already, our world, our country, uh, this place is screwed up. It's a mess. And, and one of those reasons it's such a mess is because of conflicting worldviews among people. And part of that is also, a part of that is because sometimes even Christian people don't understand their worldview. We're going to talk about that. Because there's all kinds of conflicts. Because our culture, socially, economically, uh, spiritually, politically, has so strongly influenced our worldview today that it's becoming increasingly difficult to determine what is real and true and what is phony and false. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, the Apostle Paul says, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. When you committed your life to Jesus Christ, you traded in the old life for the new life. The old way of thinking to a new way of thinking. The old is gone, the new began. But the problem sometimes come is, is when we committed our life to Jesus Christ and we took on that new life, we're still trying to operate our life on the basis of the old life. We're still trying to operate our system uh, on the old way we used to think. Not the new way in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Through the lens of our old life, we're seeing the world and as a result, we have a lot of frustration and confusion in our life because we haven't really upgraded <laughs> to the new system that came through Jesus Christ. It's like trying to operate an old computer system when you've upgraded. You ever, have you done that? You know, you've got a computer. You Hey, I've been doing this for years on this computer. And all of a sudden, there's this major upgrade of the software and you can't figure anything out anymore. That's kind of the way it is when it comes to rebooting your system when you commit your life to Jesus Christ. So this series is designed to upgrade our software, if you will, to refocus our view on the world, our worldview, to a biblical perspective. Because I believe for a follower of Jesus Christ, there is only one worldview that matters. And that is a true worldview based on truth. You see, over the course of our lives, we're influenced by the world around us, and that starts from a very early age. Uh, our family, um, our friends, our education, politics, the books we read, the media, entertainment, the music we listen to, the movies we watch, the TV we watch, advertising, all of that permeates and saturates our culture every minute of every day. And unless you're rock solid in a biblical world view, all of those influences in our lives can cause us to lose focus on the truth. Let me give you some of those influences in our culture today. Not necessarily what I would call world views, but influences to a world view. The first is materialistic. Because in a materialistic influence, the only thing that matters in life is the acquisition of things and wealth. It's all about getting stuff, you know, the pursuit of life, liberty, and the purchase of happiness. <laughs> that's not what the document says, but that's, you know. Uh, Jesus debunked that, uh, challenged it when he said, your life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. He said, your life is not just about c c accumulating stuff. It's more than that. Then there's uh, a hedonistic influence in our culture and in our world today. Now, uh, this is do whatever you want kind of an attitude, an influence. And boy, it's prevalent today. You know, I'll do whatever I want to do to make me happy, you know, or to bring pleasure. That's, that's, you know, that's the influence in my life right now. Solomon, who had something to say about pleasure, said this, You're addicted to thrills? What an empty life. Look at this. The pursuit of pleasure is never satisfied. I'm going to say that again. <laughs> the pursuit of pleasure is never satisfied. That comes from the wisest, wealthiest man that ever lived. 
You know, he had it all. And at the end of his life, in the book of Ecclesiastes, he writes about it. But in Proverbs, he just kind of says, here's kind of the prelude to my, my, my journal, you know. Let me tell you something. What I've discovered in my life is the pursuit of pleasure is never satisfied. It always wants more. It's an addiction <laughs> to pleasure. Then there's a pragmatic influence in our culture today. And this, this you know, you're just thinking, wow, okay, yeah. Pragmatic is to do whatever you want works for you in that moment. You know? It's, you know, it's, it's whatever works. Whatever suits me, right or wrong, it doesn't matter as long as it's practical for me in that particular moment. Well, the Bible says in Proverbs, there is a path before each person that seems right, but it ends in death. See, that's pragmatism. There's a path that seems right. It seems like the right thing to do, but in the end it leads to destruction. Naturalistic is another influence. Uh, this, this just basically says God doesn't is. And all these, all these come out of uh, three religious worldviews. They all, they all have, uh, have uh, you know, tentacles that come out. Uh, deistic, which is uh, uh, one God. Uh, pantheistic is where there are every, many gods, but everything's a God. And then atheistic, no God at all. And you can take these influences in our culture, in our world today, and align them with the three major worldviews, religious worldviews. One God, everything's a God, no God. <laughs> that's, you know, that's just, those are the three major worldviews, and everything comes out from them. This idea of, of naturalism, God doesn't exist, and if he does, he doesn't matter. Who needs God? You know, look around. We've got the world around us. We don't need God. Listen to this, but from the beginning of creation, God has shown what these are like by all he had made. That's why those people don't have any excuse. Oh, they know about God, but they don't honor him or even thank him. They claim to be wise, but they are fools. Another influence is humanistic. Uh, you are your own God. Um, the guy in the poem Invictus, I am the master of my fate, the captain of my soul. Yeah, no. But that is one of the influences in our culture today. I decide my own destiny. And in essence, what we're saying, I'm my own God. I make all the decisions, all the choices, right or wrong or indifferent. That's who I am. I live for me. Again, the Bible says, as Paul says in Romans, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator. Now, that's Paul writing that 2,000 years ago. <laughs> Sounds pretty contemporary today, doesn't it? Then, then this is the last one, the uh, individualistic influence. And, and I put this one at the end of the list because, I, and this one just says, nobody matters but me. What I want, what I need, life is all about me. The universe revolves around me. And I put this one at the end because I believe that all of these aforementioned influences all come now out of this particular influence. Because it's all about me. All the time. It, these all stem from a single philosophy. My, think about this, what we hear every day. My lifestyle. My choice. My rules. My feelings. My things, my destiny, my pleasure, my plan. That's, and, and when you look back at all these we mentioned, you know, pragmatism, humanism, naturalism, hedonism, it's all about me to begin with. And whatever me, whatever that path takes me on, is a path that I'm okay with. Jesus said, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you'll save it. See, and the whole focus of life these days is all about the individual. It's all about me. And here's what we reason. We reason, and because if it's all about me, I'll pick and choose the lens that I want to view my life through based on the situation in which I find myself. When I want something and I want it bad enough, I'll view life through the lens of materialism. 
when I'm dating, when I'm going on a date, then I'll view my life through the lens of hedonism, whatever makes me happy and whatever pleases me. When I'm at work closing the deal or I'm trying to get a better grade, <laughs> I'll view life at that time through the lens of pragmatism. Whatever works for me, right, wrong, doesn't matter. If it works, it make, gets me a better grade, gets me a better deal, gets me a better salary, then it's okay. When I step into the voting booth, <laughs> ooh, I'll view that through the lens of humanism. When I go to church, then I'll view that through the lens of Scripture, a biblical worldview. See, bottom line, it's all about me. And when a whole society's and culture's focus is about me, friends, I'm going to tell you, it can only produce chaos, and we're seeing that every day. It can only produce chaos, conflict, confusion, and even anarchy. Because here's the, here's the deal. Nobody or nothing else matters but me. Rick Warren in one of his books writes, the crumbling of our culture, the crisis in our schools, the controversies in our courts, the corruption in our businesses, the chaos in our government, the carnality in our churches, the confusion in our families and the conflicts in our personal lives are all caused by the futile attempt to hold to and believe and live out incompatible worldviews at the same time. And that's exactly what we're seeing in our world and especially in our nation today. The only worldview that matters, the only one that makes sense, the only one that brings peace out of chaos, the only one that brings order to anarchy, the only one that brings purpose to confusion, the only one that brings fulfillment to emptiness is a biblical world view. We're created for a purpose. You were made by God and for God. He is the creator. When you're having issues with a, a machine, you know, I do this all the time now, you know. <laughs> I learned my lesson, you know, to hit or miss trying to fix something, you know. But I've discovered that when I buy something new, the first thing I do is sit down and read the manual. <laughs> I sit down and just read the owner's manual because, you know, I want this to last and I don't want to screw it up. Now, I know some of you women find that hard to believe that. <laughs> <laughs> that any man would sit out and read the owner's manual about anything. I just know that. But I know I've, I've, I've messed up too many. <laughs> I've had to replace too much new stuff. Because <laughs> I think I ought to do it my way. But here's the thing. A biblical worldview. He is the creator. You're made by God and for God. We believe that God exists, that God gives us purpose and meaning and fulfillment in life, that he is the creator and sustainer of the universe. It only makes sense to operate this machine according to the designer, creator, and maker. Does that make sense? And, and so what is the owner's manual? Right here. Right here. I, somebody this week, one of my friends, bought a brand new car. Hadn't had a new car in 25 years. First new car he's owned in 25 years. <laughs> and he goes, I don't understand a thing. You know, my car, you got in, you turned it on, you put it in gear and drove off. He said, there's way too much to learn on this. I really need to spend a couple of weeks in the owner's manual just to figure out what, how all this stuff works. I didn't want to just tell him, just talk to it. <laughs> Just tell it what you want it to do these days, right? Uh, look at this. For everything, absolutely everything, above and below, visible and invisible, everything got started in Him. And what? Finds its purpose in Him. As we begin this series, uh, I, I, and I, I wish I could tell you this five weeks, six weeks, four weeks, I, I, I don't know, uh, you know. Uh, right now, I, I can guarantee you three. <laughs> I, I'm, that, uh, I'm that far ahead uh, in this. Uh, so we'll see, you know. 
<laughs> I, I, when I get tired of talking about it, I'll, I'll stop. That's when the series will be over. And I'm not going to wait till you get tired of listening to, to it. <laughs> if that's the case, you can come over here and do this. <laughs> no, you can't. No, you can't. Don't. Sit down. Sit down. Four ways to develop a, a worldview, to bring your worldview into focus, okay? A worldview in your life, how you perceive and interpret the world that is aligned with God's word and God's will. Okay? First of all, learn the truth. Learn the truth. This is the very first step in building a strong biblical worldview is to learn the truth. Matthew 7, Jesus told the story, very familiar story, about two guys, two builders. One built his house on, on the rock, base, a solid base foundation of rock. The other built his house on sand. And when the storm came, Jesus tells the story that the guy who built his house on the rock, the house stood firm. The guy who built his house on the sand, his house collapsed, you know. Remember? The wise man built his house upon the rock. Why? Okay, huh? It's easy. Okay, I just wanted to share that with you, let you know. There, let me tell you, there are some people generationally right now going, what was that all about? You know, they have, they've never heard that song. Well, anyway. Uh, here's the thing about that. Jesus is telling a story and he says, those who hear and believe and do my word is like the man who built his house on the rock. Those who ignore truth are like those who build the house on the sand. So that when the storms of life come, and the storms will come, not if they come, but when they come, relational storms, financial storms, health storms, marital storms, moral storms, when those storms come, and they will come, when your house is built on the solid rock foundation of the truth of the Word of God, you will stand, be able to stand in the face of tragedy and crisis. But let me tell you something. If your world is built, if your world is built on a false, uh, false, faulty worldview, when those storms do come, they will pummel your body and your life to no end. And if not, if, you, if at the core of your being is, a, is, a, is truth, you're going to stand. But if at the core of your being is a faulty, false world view, your world and your life will collapse. That is truth. Learn the truth. Proverbs 23, that's what it says. Learn the truth. And never forget it. Never reject it. Get wisdom, self-control, and understanding. You say, how do you learn truth? You spend time, you know, you spend time learning little songs. The wise man built his house upon the rock. Jesus loves the little children. All the children of the world. You learn it by spending time in the Word of God. And you learn to stand on truth. Because this book is truth. You learn the truth. You spend time in the Word of God. Because here's the next point. The only way you're going to be able to complete and follow the next point and build a solid world view is to secondly be able to discern what is false. And the only way you can discern what is false is what? <laughs> to know what is true. So we start with learning the truth so that we can learn what is false. Listen to this. Listen to this. First John. Don't believe everything you hear. What? It was, it was on the internet. It had to be true. <laughs> Don't believe everything you hear. Oh, it was on the news. <laughs> it was in the paper. I heard. <laughs> What's it say? Don't believe everything you hear. Look what it says. Carefully weigh and examine what people tell you. Because not everyone who talks about God comes from God. And have you noticed there's a lot of people talking about God these days? But they don't come from God. When you stack it up with truth. That's why you got to learn the truth. To measure, as it says there, uh, where was I? Uh, to weigh and examine what is false. There are a lot, look at it, there are a lot of lying teachers loose in the world. Now that's not specifically, you know, teachers, teachers. There's just a lot of people who are teaching uh, uh, 
a lot of untruth. A lot of lying teachers loose in our world today. Don't believe everything you hear. We'd like to believe we don't, wouldn't we? We'd really like to believe, well, I don't believe everything I hear. <laughs> because we have selective hearing and selective belief. If it agrees with us, we'll believe it. <laughs> huh? I'm not wrong about that. I'm right there with you all. You know, I got all my facts lined up, you know, and if whatever you say or whatever I read or whatever I see doesn't line up with the facts that I've already got lined up, or if it does line with what I already believe to be true, then I'm, I, okay, must be true because I agree with it. <laughs> huh? That's why it's important to have truth. So that you can say, wait a minute, I might, I might personally have this list of things, but let me ask you something, and let me just see, what does the Bible have to say? How does it stack up with the truth of God's Word? Discern what is false. Every day we are bombarded with views, opinions, philosophies, and beliefs that subtly over time, become a part of the fabric of our own personal belief system. Enough, uh, enough that even contradict the Word of God. And if we don't know the truth, we don't know that. And so, you know, it's kind of like when you start a, 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 at a point, and if for whatever reason you start from this point and you're trying to create a straight line back there, and, and, and you get off just a little bit, and you keep following, you know, by the time you get across the room or by the time you get across the field, you're hundreds of feet off the mark. And so it starts real subtle. I keep pointing to this because there's an orange stripe up here that you can't see that tells me where I'm supposed to stand. <laughs> that's why, it's just in my mind, it comes to that thing, I go, okay, I'm going to make it. But that's the way it is. I have a point here. And, you know, when we first started doing this, you know, I kept, I kept, when I was preaching, I kept moving to the left, you know, and, and Shane, oh, he just, I just got stink eye from him back there, you know, uh, that was through the illustration. And, and, and at one point we had to scrap the whole recording because I kept drifting over here and, and he, he decided to move the camera to catch me and it, boom, it just jumped like, whoa, that's sensitive. So we had to almost basically can that whole that whole recording and hope the next one was better. And he says, you're drifting on me. you got to stay on me. You're drifting on me. Okay. I'm, I'm drifting right now, you know. Oh, I'm looking. i got to hurry. Uh, we weigh and examine. i got to find out where I'm in. <laughs> Y'all do, do this to me. Uh, it has to start with a baseline of truth. It has to start with a baseline of what is right. And where do you get that? Right here. Right here. The Bible. There's a whole lot of people that doubt there's anything, anything you could call absolute truth anymore. But here it is. And I have discovered in my own personal life that when I see the world through the lens of this book, yeah, it's in bad shape, but there's an answer. There's a cure. There is hope. So you got to weigh and examine everything. Let me tell you, folks, this is not a game. This isn't, this isn't the randings of some old preacher. Uh, this is not a game. The Bible says that Satan is the father of lies. Jesus said he is the father of lies and that he always comes as an angel of light or an angel of truth. And let me tell you something. There's a whole lot of verbiage out there these days that, that sounds like truth, doesn't it? There's a whole lot of stuff out there that, that sounds like it ought to be right. Well, okay, you know, I can go along with that. That makes sense to me. But when you weigh it and examine it according to the word of God, it's all lies. It's all lies. 
Romans 3, 4. I love this verse. Let God be true (laughs) and every human being a liar. Let God be true. That's how you know you can weigh and examine and that's how you can know what's false by examining it against the truth of God's word. Let God be true and every human being a liar. I was going to leave the rest part of this off, but as it is written, so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. You see what that's saying? When you align yourself with the truth of God's word, you will be right, proven right when you speak and you will prevail when you judge according to the truth of God's word, period. Truth. i got to keep moving. Turn from the world to the word. We, I've used this verse several times um, over the course of the last several weeks, you know. <laughs> and it just keeps popping up because it just keeps getting good, you know. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit in without even thinking. Wow. That, that's what most of us do. We, we, we fit in without even thinking because it seems right or it sounds like it ought to be right or, or it sounds true. That must be true. Instead, he says, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Unlike the culture around you always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you and develops well-formed maturity in you. His good and pleasing and perfect will. God says to turn from the world to the word. You got two choices. You got two choices. To get my truth about life and living from the word of God. Which, by the way, is eternal and changeless. I can get my truth there or I can get my truth from the world and the culture around me which is lies because it comes from the father of lies and it changes with every news cycle and every poll taken as in, and oh by the way in total contradiction to the word of God. So where are you going to get it? You're going to get it from truth or lies. Turn from the world to the word. Finally concern yourself with God's agenda. Jesus put it this way. God will give you all you need from day to day. God will give you all you need from day to day if you make the kingdom of God your primary concern. Now, you know, if you had an ink pen, circle that. We don't put ink pens out because, you know, we don't want to spread anything. But, you know, underline or circle primary concern. Because here's the thing, you know this, you can't have two primary concerns. That's the idea of primary. What's your number one concern? You can't have two. Uh, You can't have two number ones in your life. And see, that's the whole problem with this individualistic influence in our life, you know, that it's all about me because (laughs) who's on the throne of that? I, well, me. I am. Oh, really? So where's God in all this? Well, he's on the throne too. Ah. <laughs> That's an X. You're wrong. You can't be. You cannot have two primary concerns. You, Jesus put it this way again another later on. He said, <laughs> you cannot serve two masters. You know, in context, you know, we talk about money, but here's the reality. You can't have two primary concerns. You can't be on the throne of your life because and, and God's not going to share that throne with you. He'll give, you, give it over to you. But then you shouldn't expect to count on Him in your life because look what He says. He'll give you all you need from day to day. God's going to take care of my every need from day to day if He is number one in my life. What's that mean? Putting him first, giving him number one, making him the primary concern. That means aligning your heart with his, his heart, that you care about the things and love the things that God loves. It means aligning your mind with his mind. It means aligning your view of this world and people. Aligning your view with his. 
Folks, you know this better than I do, as well as I do. Now more than ever, people need truth. They need truth. They've built their lives on the shifting sand of popular opinion and pop culture. And when they collapse, they have no hope. We have what they need. We have the message that this world needs. What we need in this world today are followers of Jesus Christ who know what they believe, who know why they believe it, who can explain it to the people in their life and in their world, and most importantly, people who live it. Let's pray. God, we are thankful for the truth of your word. And God, I'm thankful for that solid foundation of rock that not only can we build our lives on, but we can stand on that truth. And I pray, God, as we begin this series, that you'll open our hearts and our minds to be receptive to your word and your will. That, Father, we'll, we'll, we'll stop this dance of trying to exist with two primary concerns or more in our lives. That We'll, we'll stop this idea of... of Weaving in and out. <laughs> try, try, settling for the influences that best serve us for that particular time. I pray God that every moment of every day, when faced with a challenge, we will always stand for truth. And be a light in a dark world of lies and falsehood. Father, help us to repent when we've left the mark, when we've gone offline. We're out there wondering in a world that is confusing, contradictory, chaotic. Bring us back to center. Bring us back to see the world the way you see the world. By understanding what truth is, your word, by being able to discern what is not true, what is false, what is fake, what is phony. To turn from the world into your word and make you our primary concern in life. God, that's my prayer as we start this series and as we go throughout it. Father, drive us deeper into your word for truth. In Jesus' name. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And he made that journey possible on the cross. And every week we get together, we take time out of our services to remember that sacrifice through the act of communion. A wafer of bread that represents the body of Christ. A cup of grape juice that represents the blood of Christ price for your salvation and mine and the truth is God loves you the truth is that God loves you too much to let you stay that way and so he sent his only son Jesus and through his redeeming work on the cross we have salvation forgiveness and the promise of eternal life through him so as we uh come together sometimes these are harder than usual aren't they remembering the body of Christ let's eat the wafer together and the blood that cleanses us from all unrighteousness let's drink the cup together Lord God, our joy today comes through you. We embrace, relish the truth that you loved us so much that you sent your only son. The truth that we could do nothing on our own. The truth that we are lost 
our sinful nature controls us too much, too often. But because of what Jesus accomplished on the cross of Calvary, we can defeat the power of sin, the power of death, and claim forgiveness through your grace and mercy as shown through him on the cross. So God, we thank you for this weekly reminder of the truth of your love for us. In Jesus' name.